This morning, 48 hours away from Super Tuesday in Texas, the day that will make or break presidential campaigns. We'll talk Bernie, Biden, Bloomberg, and more. The coronavirus, is Texas really ready? The most senior physician in Congress, Michael Burgess, is with us from D.C. DNC has declared Texas a battleground state and putting its money where its mouth is. We'll ask the state party what the national investment means for candidates and campaigns. And Congress passes a bill that makes lynching a federal crime. Almost every Texan in Congress voted for it, all but one. We'll tell you why Republican Louie Gohmert said no. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. And good morning. We have lots to cover on the coronavirus and on Super Tuesday. But first, let's get you caught up on the political headlines we are watching across Texas. Super Tuesday now 48 hours away and Texas will have a big say in the Democratic presidential nominee. That's not always the case. In many election cycles, presidential nominees are often settled by the time Texans vote. So if you didn't early vote, remember that polls are open from 7 until 7 on Tuesday. Congress finally did something it's talked about for decades. Passed bills that would make lynching a federal crime. Only four, though, voted against it in the House. And one on your screen right here, Congressman Louis Gohmert from Tyler. The Republican said the bill's maximum 10-year prison sentence is not long enough. And a new poll confirms what we already suspected about the Democratic race. For U.S. Senate here in Texas, M.J. Hagar leads the pack substantially. Senator Royce West, former Congressman Chris Bell, and Christina Tsitsun Ramirez are all statistically tied for second. The University of Houston conducted this survey with more than 1,300 likely voters. We are counting down to Super Tuesday this morning, but first want to talk about the coronavirus. Mexico just reported its first two cases of it. There are no confirmed cases of coronavirus in Texas outside that quarantine at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. Governor Abbott says that state agencies here started preparing more than a month ago. We have a, an extremely robust, well-informed, activated force prepared for any potential outcome that we may have to deal with. So now let's go to a Texas doctor in Congress. Representative Michael Burgess is a Republican who represents Denton County in North Texas. He joins us from the Capitol this morning and in studio with me as always is Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Bud, you, uh, welcome morning, to Jason. you and Congressman, good to see you as well too. Congressman. Good, good morning, thanks for having me on. You're, you're the most senior doctor uh, in Congress. How concerned should I be right now about this coronavirus and all the news that's happened in the past few days? Jason, again, thanks for having me on. It has been my contention for over a month that this is a serious situation that we all need to take seriously. It is not something that you can ignore and certainly not going to help to be dismissive. Now, I was very encouraged when at the end of January, the administration did listen when I spoke up and said, I really think we need to restrict some of the travel between mainland China and this country. And they did. The next day, Secretary Azar came on television and announced a rather historic quarantine and the cessation of all flights to and from mainland China to the United States. That was a big step. It's kind of a bold step. Some people said, are you doing too much? Well, you know, if you are, you can always come back and loosen things up a little bit. It turns out that was a good idea. It has given us an additional four weeks where our case rate is low yeah. to be able to prepare and, and respond to this. Well, I will say this, this morning, or Friday morning, I had a, a briefing with all of the public health individuals and We've sort of moved from a situation of containment to containment plus mitigation, and that's the situation this morning. Well, let's talk about the public health folks for a moment. The president's budget for next year cuts the CDC's budget by 16 percent. Now, you know, he has proposed cutting public health before. Congress has overridden that. Do you expect that's going to happen this time as well? Well, look, the president's budget was prepared in December. Uh, well in advance of any knowledge of what was going to happen in China a month later. But realistically, when we're the United States House of Representatives. All spending bills originate with us. If we take the president's number and we say 
we don't think that's right. Yeah. We can do our hearings, we can gather our information and come up with a different number. In fact, I think we will. And I think you will see that happen next week. Unfortunately, it's not going through a normal budgetary process. It's not even going through hearings in the Energy and Commerce Committee. It will be a hearing in the Rules Committee. And fortunately for me, I sit there as well. So I'll get to hear the arguments pro and con, but a, a number will be determined and I would expect the House will vote on that sometime next week. Well, will it be an increase or a decrease? I would suspect it will be an increase because as you've seen sort of every week as this story has evolved, and it has evolved, it's not the same story today yeah. that it was at the end of January. But as, as the story evolves, clearly there is more involvement, more people, more personnel, more testing, more equipment. And so when I mentioned <laughs> containment plus mitigation, the, the situation this morning is very much, we need to get testing facilities into the hands of our frontliners in our health departments across the country so that they're able to narrow the window of time where someone comes in and identifies themselves and say, I, I think I might have this, where they can be tested and either reassured that they're negative or found that they're positive and then contained or quarantined. Congressman, you've talked about where we are now. Can we please talk about what's next. What are the things coming that the public may not be aware of? We're all just seeing this, this potential, you know, we might get sick, but tell us as far as shortages of antibiotics, shortages of equipment, shortages of tests for testing. Tell us what the other uh, ancillary uh, problems are that will arise. So the, uh, there are constantly drugs in shortage. I think the shortage list is uh, numbers in the 140s. That is not new. That has been the case for several years. There is apparently one product that has been added to the list that has occurred because of the interruption of the supply chain of the active pharmaceutical ingredient that comes from China. This is not a generic drug, it's a name brand drug. We weren't told which name it was, but we were also told there are other similar drugs in that classification which can be substituted. So right now, there's not a shortage that is directly affecting anyone. That can change. And of course, 13% of the pharmaceutical products and active pharmaceutical ingredients do come from mainland China. That that will be felt in the, the months and weeks ahead. There are other places from which those supplies, including domestic supplies, and certainly those capacities need to be increased and things like continuous round the clock manufacturing are some of the things that I'm hearing right now that, uh, that, uh, that are being discussed. But that will be part of the budget discussion next week, the funding discussion. All right. Food and Drug Administration, if it doesn't have adequate funding, they need to tell us and, and we need to provide it. All Thank right. you, Congressman. Congressman uh, Michael Burgess, thanks for being uh, in D.C. with us this morning. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. There's a lot of chatter among Texas Democrats about the Bernie Sanders effect. Sanders is popular in the state. A poll last week showed him tied with Biden in the top spot. But Democrats are privately wondering whether nominating Bernie for president, whether that might turn away moderates and independents who might want an alternative to President Trump. So in for Ross Ramsey this morning is Abby Livingston. She is one of the star reporters covering uh, D.C and Congress for the Texas Tribune. Thanks for coming in today, appreciate that. Thanks for having me. If Bernie is a nominee, de Democrats are talking privately to me, and I'm sure to you as well too, that this might not bring people to the polls and it might affect down ballot candidates. They've been speaking publicly to me as well. And so the, the what has been amazing is, person after person has said he jeopardizes the Democratic efforts to ca capture the state house of representatives, which would mean an, an influence in redistricting next decade, but also it could affect control of the United States Congress, meaning Nancy Pelosi's gavel. And so it's it's been amazing, but what, what strikes me about these conversations, it's not coming from firebrands, people who like to rumble in politics, yeah. it's coming from some of the most subdued members of the Democratic Party in the state. Some who might be safe probably as well. At safe seats, they are worried about defeating Donald Trump and control of the House. Let's talk about Congress for a moment. Two Texans in Congress are having the fight of their political lives. Kay Granger in North Texas, Henry Cuellar in South Texas. How consequential is it if either lose or if they both lose? It's consequential on in two different ways. One, Texas is one of the states that has the first congressional primaries. We've had presidential primaries, we haven't had congressional. If, if either of them or both of them lose, it could be a warning shot to incumbents all across the country and it could, upheave, it could create an upheaval in the House. On top of that, both are what we call appropriators in Congress. And I know that word kind of makes eyes glaze over. Yeah. They decide spending and 
all of the appropriators are either threatened or they're retiring from Congress from Texas. And that could expose the state if there's a major disaster where uh -huh. the state needs money or infrastructure. And it makes it harder for Texas to compete with other states like California, New York, and Florida. Wow. All right. Abby Livingston from the Texas Tribune. Back to you in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Now to our weekly opinion segment. This week is about accountability, specifically with Child Protective Services. And one judge in Tarrant County that rules on these cases Here's Sydney Walker from the Facebook page, Coffee and Politics 101, with my voice, my opinion. Is politics in play? A judge is being removed from handling most CPS cases in Tarrant County. This after Judge Alex Kim came under scrutiny following the Tinsley Lewis case. She's the one-year-old who was on life support at Cook Children's Hospital. Judge Kim issued an order stopping the removal of life support the hospital wanted. Conservative groups cheered his decision. But before the Tinsley case, Judge Kim handled all Child Protective Service cases. Last week, district judges voted to allow the family law courts, in addition to Kim's court, to handle CPS. Judge Kim has been known to go against C CPS recommendations to remove children from their homes and to force the agency to follow the law. Will having more judges help hold CPS accountable? Or is Kim's removal a sign that his days may be even more numbered in Tarrant County when re-election time comes? I'm Sydney Walker, and this is my voice, my opinion. Yeah, up, Texas Democrats just got a big investment. The National Party writing checks for Texas campaigns and declaring the state a battleground. We'll go to Austin for context in a moment. And the politics of the coronavirus, will it affect the 2020 election? A serious question in this medical crisis. Flashpoint debates it in a moment. You're watching Inside Texas Politics. This is, video. This is a real coronavirus drill from China. <laughs> you know what? When the SWAT team can't get the job done, send in the guy with the pool skimmer. <laughs> Time to take your phone out this morning and open up the camera. You're going to need it in just a moment. We had a couple of firsts in this episode of Yolitics. Spilled our first pint. Actually, I did that, not Wheeler. And we also had a loyal listener crash our interview. This one is all about the crazy costs of health care in Texas. Turns out doctors and patients are not waiting on lawmakers to help lower the costs. We've had a lot of interest in this episode. Now get your phone out. Aim your camera at this QR code. When it opens a window, click on that. It's going to take you directly to this episode of Yolitics. And remember, new episodes drop every Tuesday. You know, Texas Democrats have long predicted this state turning blue. Last week, the National Party suggested that might be closer than ever, and the DNC is even making a financial investment in hopes of making that a reality. It is a welcome shot of energy in Austin at the Texas Democratic Party's headquarters. Manny Garcia is the party's executive director. He is with us now. Manny, good morning to you. Good morning. Hey, tell us how much the DNC is investing and what is that money specifically going towards? You know, we're in conversations with the National Party right now about how to make sure that Texas is best prepared to support our nominee uh, once we go through this presidential primary process. Um, so, you know, right now we have 50 talented operatives at the Texas Democratic Party. It is the largest we have been at this point of the election cycle um, in, in, in our history. And with this new investment from the Democratic National Committee, we're going to be able to scale up that, uh, that work. We're going to be able to put organizers on the ground across the state of Texas. So it's going to be a substantial investment, um, but it is just the first of many. Uh, it's been very welcoming to see that the National yeah. Party and really all of the national committees, the Congressional Campaign Committee, the Senatorial Campaign Committee, the Legislative Campaign Committee, have been interested in Texas and well, working with us to build the infrastructure me, necessary to win. Mandy, let me ask you about that. I often hear Democrats talking about 2018 and how it shows that Democrats were closer than ever. 2018, though, had that rock 
star candidate at the top of the ballot, attracting the moderates, attracting the independents. We don't have a Beto O'Rourke this year. Here's what we've seen in Texas over the past couple of years. In 2016, for the first time in two decades, we became a single digit state at the presidential level. In 2018, we narrowed that gap to just 2.5 points statewide. We picked up two congressional seats. We picked up two state Senate seats. We picked up 12 state House seats. And we saw that support all across the state uh, increase. And, and certainly we did a tremendous amount of work. We're, you know, a tremendous amount of credit goes to Metro work in the United States Senate race. You know, but folks like Colin Allred in the Dallas area and Lizzie Fletcher in, in the Houston area were running robust campaigns that were both uh, picking up the folks that were under them and, and pushing up Beto O'Rourke as well. And those state house campaigns were no joke in the DFW area. Um, they were running robust efforts and they were getting the job done. Now you're looking at 2020. <clears throat> now you're nine seats away from flipping the Texas House, yeah. 22 within single digits, 10 congressional districts at 10 points, seven already on the national target list, a U.S. Senate race that's within the margin of error, and a presidential race where poll after poll after poll shows that Texans right now uh, would not vote to re-elect Donald Trump. All right, Manny, good luck to you guys, and uh, congratulations on the investment from the National Party. I know you guys have looked forward to that for a long time. Appreciate it, man. We heard Thank from you. Congressman Burgess a moment ago about the coronavirus. Let's look at the politics of it now. Flashpoint asking a good question this morning. Will this medical crisis affect the 2020 election? From the right this morning, Wade Emmert, the former chairman of the Dallas County Republican Party. And from the left, Rich Hancock from virtualnewscenter.com. Thanks, Jason, and good morning. Well, the first confirmed case of coronavirus that is not directly related to a flight from China has been reported in California, and now America has to consider what we are doing about the coronavirus and how it's going to affect the 2020 election. Wade, do you think the coronavirus is going to affect President Trump's campaign, or is he doing all he can do right now to, to deal with corona? So I think any time a uh, president has to deal with a crisis, it does affect a campaign. I will say, though, that the coronavirus is obviously serious. It is obviously something we need to take, be diligent about how we respond to it. But Democrats are creating a, pushing a f agenda of fear, trying to say President Trump is not appropriately responding to the uh, to the outbreak. I think that's hogwash. I think the reality is he is he's got a, a, a strategy of containment. The CDC is responding appropriately. We, there are a lot we don't know in terms of how it ultimately re will spread. But I think the president and his staff is appropriately responding. So the Democrats, what the Democrats are saying is hogwash. Right. It's hogwash to say that the president is not responding adequately. He called the coronavirus tantamount to the flu. The coronavirus, this potentially global pandemic, is not the flu. It is a serious situation, and the CDC should be in charge of who deals with it and when and why. But the president is trying to spin it because it's affecting his stock market, upon which you know he hangs a lot of his, his success as president. Well, the coronavirus is much like the flu. It does spread much like the flu, maybe not to the same degree as the flu would, but it's very similar to the flu. And I think you're right. I think the president is concerned about the stock market, as we all should be, because so much of uh, our response and how we affect it it impacts the economy. And a gunshot wound is much like a bee sting, because they're both injuries. From the left, I'm Rich Hancock. From the right, Wade Emmert. Texas Democrats are kind of paralyzed right now. Yes, the DNC is making an investment, but voters are wondering what to do on Super Tuesday. Vote with their hearts or their minds. We'll start there next on the round table. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Abby Livingston from the Texas Tribune is still with us, but Kennedy, of course, from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and Bernadine Steptoe, the political producer at WFAA. And Abby, since you're our special guest, we're starting with you. Democratic voters really have a decision to make if they haven't already early voted. Did they vote with their hearts or their minds when they go to the polls? What do you think is going to happen? It's a big decision ahead, and I've heard anecdotally some Democrats being paralyzed. They want, they're so afraid of making the wrong choice and the wrong nominee that they're paralyzed and they don't know what to do. And what I can just say is I spend my life studying this, and the experts in Washington do too, and we don't know 
what the most electable candidate is. So probably just vote your heart. What do you think is going to happen, bud? Abby, they're paralyzed because they don't understand the delegate system. There are really only two candidates in contention in Texas. Either Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders, both of them actually, will get a big chunk of delegates. Maybe Elizabeth Warren will get a delegate. Maybe Mike Bloomberg will. Everybody else is toast. It's a two-person race. And, and Bernard, uh, Bernadine, let's, let's you know, look out here a, a little ways. 48 hours from now, who's going to win Texas? Will it be a tie like the polls suggest? I'm not going to step out on a limb and answer that because they just said nobody knows. Yeah. But I think that you're going to see a close race between Biden and Sanders because Sanders is giving uh, Biden a run for his money and Biden is as well. But I also think that Bloomberg might uh, play a factor. He just probably won't get the 15% needed to get a delegate. Yeah, indeed, Sanders has surged. Hey, you know, Bud, the big winners, though, in all this are the TV stations. Because Boy, no the, kidding. The, the candidates have been spending a lot of money on ads. Mike Bloomberg uh, is in a lot of the smaller cities. You had Bernie Sanders, Tom Steyer, and others. Are you surprised at how this is playing out on TV, considering they need those delegates? Some of this is a delegate strategy. They're looking at which senatorial districts, done by state senate districts, where they might pick up a couple extra delegates. Uh, Bloomberg spent a lot of money in small markets. You know, Beaumont and Corpus are seen as, sw seen as swing districts. They, they can pick up some Democrats there, maybe Amarillo. Uh, they're trying to spread, spread their money around and cover all of Texas. And, and Abby, this, this is strategic in these buys, right? It's not just blanketing the airwaves. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the things I had a Democratic strategist point this out to me months ago, we may look at the percentages on election night and see that one candidate got such and such percent of the vote, but we may not know who won what delegates until several days later. Several days later, Bernadine, I mean, that, that, that's incredible to think about that because these campaigns have to leave the state and move on to the next voting states. That's true, but it's not uncommon in Texas. It's just that the eyes are on the delegates this go around this uh, session, this election, but this, that's not uncommon in Texas. Uh, Abby, last thing, since you're our guest today, any predictions on uh, Tuesday, what we're going to see? I wouldn't be surprised if Joe Biden outperforms what expectations are. Maybe not by much, but I just, it's a gut instinct I have and what I feel in the air. And Bud, he really needs that, doesn't he? He does, and the, the large Democratic turnout will help him. All the traditional Democratic voters pouring to the polls, some of them are probably his. Good deal. Guys, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Abby, thanks for being here as well, too. And thank you for watching Inside Texas Politics. We'll see you again next Sunday. Hope you have a good day.